In this tutorial, you learn how to make your designs reactive to sound with RGB LEDs, but you could drive servos or pneumatic actuators with the data just as well. The reading and processing of sound is covered in detail in the two previous tutorials Audio Input from a Headphone Jack and Audio Input from an Amplified Microphone. Here we'll specifically cover the VU or PP meter effect and the peak hold and decay algorithm. In the description below the video, you will find a link to a GitHub repository that includes a wiring schematic, the bill of materials, and detailed explanations for each line of code. But first of all, let's have a look at a bit of theory. Physically, sound is a vibration that travels through a transmissive medium as an acoustic wave. Sound waves are rapid changes of pressure and particle velocity, and music, speech or noise are complex superpositions of sinusoidal sound waves. The amplitude of a sound wave determines its volume, and the frequency determines its pitch. In this tutorial, we are concerned with the amplitude, the volume or loudness. Loudspeaker cones or headphone diaphragms move air molecules backwards and forwards. A plotted audio waveform looks symmetrical and the volume at any moment depends on both positive and negative domains, on the peak-to-peak -peak level. At the zero crossing, the pressure and volume are zero. That's also where you want to cut and splice your samples when editing music. Meters that monitor and display a sound's amplitude come in two varieties, volume unit meters and peak program meters. They seem to do the same thing, but they reveal different properties of an audio signal. A volume unit meter displays the average level RMS, and it takes around 300 milliseconds to stabilize. In other words, it's an integrator, averaging the signal over a short period. A peak program meter displays peak values, and it updates every 10 milliseconds. That means it shows discrete peaks, the so-called transients, as they occur. The difference between RMS level and volume peaks is called crest factor, which can be considerable depending on the type of music, speech or noise you monitor. We'll use RGB LED rings to visualize the peaks, so we need to look at the peak hold and decay principle. We need an algorithm that detects peaks as fast as possible, lights up the number of LEDs that correspond to the peak value, holds the peak LED for a certain time, and then either drops it back towards zero or fades it to off. So let's look at the code to find out how to do it. We are not considering the audio input and processing code because that part is explained in the two previous audio tutorials. First we must include the fastled library and declare some constant and changing variables always in pairs for the left and right channels. How do we ensure the right colors are displayed by the LEDs? We use an array that holds the colors to be shown, and another one that holds the colors to be used, and then we copy what's needed from the latter to the former. So we instance two CRGB display arrays for the left and right audio channel, and a CRGB color gradient array. We define a color gradient with two color stops, but you could also use a solid color or any other fastlet gradient setting method. In setup, we initialize the two display arrays for the two LED rings and fill the colors array with the color gradient we just defined. In loop, we calculate the current peak to peak value for the left and right audio channels from the minimum and maximum and then filter it with a leaky integrator so we have fast attack and slow decay. Then we map the filtered value to the number of LEDs, including the adjustment of audio dynamics with one of the two potentiometers. Now we can call the peak hold and decay functions for the left and right audio channels. It's just 11 lines of code. Only when the new peak value is larger than the previous peak value, it is set to the new peak value. We also take the time of when that happened. Then we set the peak decay indicator to false, so that the peak LED can't start to decay until the peak hold interval has expired. If the peak decay indicator is set to false, 
and the peak held interval has expired, we set the peak decay indicator to true. So now the peak LED is allowed to decay. We add the peak held interval to the time of when the new peak occurred and subtract the first peak decay interval. Because the peak decay indicator is now set to true, this if statement will not be revisited while the LED decays. Finally, while the peak decay indicator is set to true and another peak decay interval has expired, we continue decaying the peak LED while it is above zero. Now we can light the LED rings. We clear the LED ring arrays and set the brightness in case it was adjusted with one of the two potentiometers. In two for loops we copy the color array data into the two display arrays up to the new peak level value. We also set the peak LED to red and then display the result. Finally, we need to check the potentiometers in case the input dynamics or LED brightness were adjusted. To keep it simple, we keep hardware to a minimum because the clever stuff happens as always in the code. Here's an overview of all parts in case you're not so familiar with them. You'll need the specified components, but you can find cheaper substitutes online. The wiring of all three setups is very straightforward. So, let's see the whole setup in action.
And now it's your turn. Thank you for watching and listening.